to the club. So this problem here, I ask you to have a look at it. It's another completing the square question. So we take our initial expression. We get rid of whatever the C value is. Remember in a quadratic, it's in the form of AX squared plus BX plus C, all right? So we vacate the C value, get rid of that. So I do that by adding a one to both sides. That gives me three X squared minus four X. Then I leave a little blank here because I wanna complete the square, all right? The perfect square trinomial, all right? So then as a side computation to figure out the ideal number to put in that little blank, we compute B squared over four A. All right, so I take my B value, which is negative four. I square that and I divide it by four times the A value, so four times three. And I'm looking at 16 over 12, All right? Now that reduces. So I might as well, that's going to reduce to four thirds. All right, that number is the number that gets added to both sides. I'm going to add a four thirds here. I'm going to add a four thirds here. All right. On the left hand side, I'm going to factor out whatever the A value is. Even if it doesn't divide in evenly to every term, I'm going to factor it out. So I'm going to put a three in front, and then I'm going to divide each one of these terms by the three. All right. So take a three x squared, divide it by three, you get an x squared. Take a negative four x, divide it by three, we would write that as negative four thirds x. Take four thirds and divide it by three. If you're unsure, you put that in Desmos. You know, it's gonna put it in decimal form, but it presents you with a fractional answer. Uh, it's really the same as multiplying the denominator by three of the original fraction or multiplying four thirds by one third when you divide by three, but Desmos can do it for you too. So you know, there's no need to make that more challenging than it needs to be. They get four ninths, all right? Now this expression should be a perfect square trinomial. All right, and generally after you carry out this process, if the first term of the trinomial is perfect and, and the last term is perfect, then you can be pretty convinced. So this term here and this term here, if they're both perfect, then you can be pretty satisfied that you're dealing with a perfect square trinomial. All right. Oh, uh, thanks, Sharon. I'll get you for a minute. So the right-hand side, I mean, you can get a common denominator and add them together, seven thirds. That's if you want to do it by hand. Otherwise, one plus four thirds. You get two and two thirds, seven thirds when you convert it over. All right. Now, the next step in the process would be to get rid of that. Well, it, you can go either way with this one, but that three's got to go, and we have to factor this expression. Right. Most folks like to get rid of that three because it's just kind of in the way. So I'm going to multiply both sides by one third. Hold on, let me close the door. Be right back. Otherwise, you were going to get a nice breakdown of all the homework that my son has. So anyway, one third times three is going to be one. That cancels. So we'd have x squared minus four thirds x plus four ninths. On the right-hand side, that's just going to be seven over nine. All right. Now, when we factor a perfect square trinomial, it's very simple, the process. 
once you recognize that it's perfect square, you take the square root of the first term, you take the square root of the last term, that kind of walked on me. So that's an X, that's a two thirds. And then you just bring down whatever the, the middle sign is in your trinomial. And if you're unsure, you could check in Desmond's because this expression should be equivalent to this expression, right? So I can take that first expression X squared minus four thirds X plus four ninths. All right, that plots it as a function. The X minus two thirds as a quantity squared should plot to the same location. All right, so this one, this one, both go into the same location, so they're equivalent, all right? So then I would take the square root of both sides. I'm going to rewrite just because it's getting a little messy. We have X minus two thirds as a quantity squared is equal to seven ninths. I'm going to take the square root of both sides. That's what we do when we want to get rid of a power of two. On the left side, X minus two thirds. On the right side, take the square root of each part. The square root of seven can't do anything with. The square root of nine is a three, so I would call this plus or minus the square root of seven over just a three. And then I would add two thirds to both sides. So this would become X is equal to two thirds plus or minus the square root of seven over three. Or if you want, you can just put it all together in one fraction, but you could also leave it apart like this too. Honestly, I mean, the act of solving the quadratic isn't really the reason why we're going over is completing the square technique. We need it for conic sections. So really, once you get to a certain point, it really doesn't matter what, how you represent your final answer, right? But if you wanna be reasonably assured that you didn't just botch it all up, you can type in the original function, y equals three x squared minus four x, minus one, see what the roots ought to be, about negative 0.215, about 1.549, and then just check your values. So two thirds minus the fraction square root of seven over three. All right, that's one of them. Let me just do a quick duplicate, change the minus to a plus. All right, just a quick double check. Yeah. I mean, the ones on the graph are the rounded form, but these are the, the, the pure decimal values that would lead to those rounded forms. So pretty, uh, pretty confident in, in this final answer. So it's pretty, pretty solid stuff. Right. Now, we're gonna expand this to two variables in a few minutes, but before we do that, we kind of wanna go back and review um, circle equations. Right, at least in standard form, because when we're presented with a conic section in non-standard form or general form, that's that's where things get a little little dicey. All right, so one thing at a time. But the definition of a circle, you can see, not the not the simplest definition you've ever seen, but it's the kind of idea where you know like. Most people don't need a definition of a circle in order to understand what the geometric figure of a circle really is. But the technical definition is the locus of points equidistant from a single point, right? And all that means is that if you start off at a single point and decide on a distance, right? Let's say a distance of two feet. If you were to, if you were to take that distance and travel in every single direction from that fixed point, the path that you generate would be the path of a circle, all right? So that would be like saying, all right, um, you know, coordinate zero, zero, for example. 
I could go out two units to the right. I can go two units up. I could go two units down. I could go two units to the left, but I, I could also go two units at a 45 degree angle. So that's kind of weird to think about, right? Because what we're really dealing with is a modifier to the unit circle, right? If I go out one unit in every direction and draw a circle, that's the unit circle. But if I were to go out two units in every direction, it wouldn't be the unit circle, but it would have the same structure. All right. So I would have some values along that circumference that are that are predictable. Like, for example, in the unit circle, I know that there's a coordinate. At, let's say, 45 degrees, well, exactly 45 degrees where the coordinates are radical two over two comma radical two over two. So if the radius was equal to two. Then I would just double those values. And that would give me a new point along the circumference of this circle, right? But that that distance, the distance from this point to this point, would still be two units, right? So from that origin value or the center of the circle to that new point that I just plotted, that that would be a, a radius of two. And I could do the same thing. I mean, it, it wouldn't be. The most practical way to go about it, but I could take every coordinate from the unit circle and double it, double every coordinate on the unit circle and get new coordinates that would flesh out a circle with a radius of two. If I took every coordinate on the unit circle and tripled it, that would give me a circle with a radius of three and so on. All right. So So what we need to do is come up with a more efficient way of handling this because, you know, Desmos is a pretty powerful tool. If I told you that all you had to do to come up with a circle with a radius of two is type in R equals two, that, that sounds great. The problem is we have no basis to understand where on earth this R is coming from. It's a new variable. We've only been working with X's and Y's, right? This is what's called a polar equation, right? It's a coordinate, it's a new coordinate system that we generally will only really start to understand once we fully understand circles, just every aspect of the circle, all right? And so what we'll do is we'll just kind of dial it back and say, all right, forget about that. I mean, that's a nice convenient way of writing the equation of a, of a circle. I mean, if I want a radius of three, I can put R equals three, that's wonderful. But we don't have the means to understand why that works the way it does just yet. So what we do is we use these rectangular equations, X minus H squared plus Y minus K squared is equal to R squared, or X squared plus Y squared is equal to R squared if the center of the circle is at zero, zero, All right? So let's say, for example, I'm just trying to model what I have up on the Desmos screen. If the center, for example, is zero, zero, and the radius is two, then I would be saying that the equation is x squared plus y squared is equal to four. All right, so it'll accomplish the same job or the same task, but it's a different coordinate system. It's the, the rectangular coordinate system, the one we were, we've been working with. The benefit of Desmos over something like a TI calculator is that you can put this equation in just as it is. You don't have to worry about solving it for Y first, All right? So let me take you back to this equation because this one is the most general form of a circle equation, right? So I'll get a fresh Desmos for this. If I just type this in in its general form, x minus h squared plus y minus k squared, is equal to r squared. 
See, it's asking me for sliders for HK and R. HK represents the center of the circle, wherever I want the center to be, All right? R represents the radius. So if I wanted the center of the circle, so basically that, that circle I just had up on the screen where the center was at zero, zero and the radius is equal to two, I would just slide my slider to zero if it'll land on it. If not, I'll just type it in. I hate when I have it and, it's, and then I do something that makes it pop off. All right, I got it. All right, and then a radius of two. So this is the same circle that I had before. Except I use sliders to get there. All right, the H and K represent the center, but it's also giving us a horizontal translation. All right, so the H is a horizontal translation. And the K is a vertical translation. And remember, translation is just a fancy word for shift, right? The vertical shift, everything gets shifted upwards or downwards. Horizontal shift, everything gets shifted left or right. Okay, so if I want to have a circle with a radius of two that's centered at zero, zero, that, that's what this, this would give us. But let's say I wanted to take that circle and, and just shift every single point a unit to the right, I would just make my H value equal to one. Everything gets shifted to the right. And if I wanted it to go down one unit, I would make my K value a negative one and it would shoot it, shift every point in the downward direction one unit, All right? So <clears throat> when you're talking about something like X squared plus Y squared equals eight, and you want to determine, so we're going the other way here, you want to determine the center and the radius. First off, if, there's no H and K value in there, then it's centered at zero, zero. The general form, I'm sorry, the standard form is that whatever's on the left is gonna be equal to R squared. So this E has to be equal to R squared. So if I know R squared is equal to E, then R is gonna be equal to the square root of E. All right, so that would be my radius. Now, there is that whole idea of the plus or minus. So let me just show you really quickly. Let's say I have a radius instead of a two, I have a radius of negative two. And it gets smaller, gets smaller, but then it gets bigger and bigger and bigger. A circle with a radius of negative two is exactly the same in terms of the path that's created as a circle with a radius of positive two. So there's no change, right? And that has to do with the understanding of how you're actually plotting points. If you're if you're plotting a radius of two, let me let me plot the the center here. H comma k, and if I wanted to plot a point, let's say let's say the, the point two units to the right, all right? It's gonna, if I go two units to the right, I'm gonna get a point on the circle, all right? But let's say I decide that I don't wanna go two units to the right. My, I want a radius of negative two. So right becomes left, up becomes down, everything gets reversed. So if a person said, I wanna go two units to the right, if, the circle has a radius of negative two instead of a positive two, that's just two units to the left. But the bottom line is whether you go to the right, oh, this would be three negative one. Whether you go to the right or to the left, you're still gonna end up on the circle, All right? So whether you go forwards, backwards, 
what whatever that means in terms of the context if you're going right the opposite of that backwards would be left if you're going up backwards of that would be down 45 degrees backwards from that would be uh five pi over four or uh 225 degrees bottom line is it's still going to give you a point on the circle All right so long story short to we don't need the negative Right, so the radius value is going to be an absolute measure. Right, you also, uh, for, for me, you don't have to worry about simplifying or anything. Right, so when we say the radius is radical eight, yeah, you could write it as two radical two or the decimal form of that, um, like 2.818, I think. Uh, but that's not necessary. Right, so the next one is a little simpler. The center again is based off of the H and K values. So the standard form for a circle, x minus h squared plus y minus k squared is equal to r squared, all right? So it's really just kind of like an apples to apples comparison. I have x minus two, that's gonna be equal to negative h. Uh, I'm sorry, x minus two is gonna be equal to x minus h, all right? Now this y here, that's the weird one. That could also be thought of as y minus zero squared. All right, so my apples to apples comparison here is gonna be y minus zero is equal to y minus k. All right, in both of these equations, you'll see that the variables cancel as in the x and the y. So if I subtract an x from both sides, it cancels away. It, this is kind of like what we were doing back with synthetic division. We would get H is equal to two, which really just gives us the opposite of whatever the sign was in the binomial. All right. The Y's cancel here and I get negative zero is equal to negative K. That's the same as saying zero is equal to K. So now I know my H and K values, All right? H comma K is the center. So I now know that the center of this circle is two zero. That being said, I mean, I I can just put it, I can put the original equation into Desmos, right? I don't even need the fancy stuff. You now just actually type in the original equation as you see it. And then you can determine from there where the center is going to be. I mean, you'd have to kind of eyeball it a little, a little bit, but if you know that there's symmetry, this one's at two five, that one's at two negative five, pretty safe bet that the X value is going to be two and you're going halfway between negative five and positive five, that's going to be two zero. And right? so you can, you can get it as a visual also. All right. So the radius, The radius is determined by whatever r squared is equivalent to. So r squared is equal to 25, square root of both sides, you get r is equal to five. So the center is two, zero, and the radius is five, all right? But if the numbers are convenient enough, you can just count boxes. Okay. Going the other way is a little simpler, right? Because again, we're looking at x minus h squared plus y minus k squared is equal to r squared. That's our standard form. So as long as I can identify h, k, and r, I'm good, all right? So the h is the x value of the center. The k is the y value of the center. The R value, sometimes it's just flat out given to you, sometimes it's not, all right? So in this case, it is. So X minus three, just replacing the H with a three, the negative is built into the equation, plus Y minus negative two would be Y plus two, 
squared is equal to three squared, which is going to be nine. Right. But I don't really, if I'm, if I'm given the center and the radius, I don't really need the equation in order to graph it. Because I could just plot the center, count the radius, and then draw a circle. All right. I mean, it'll look nicer on Desmos, so you know, you might want to consider that. But you can always get the information that you need, or use the information that you have in order to graph the the function by hand. All right. So x minus two squared plus y minus five squared. R squared. Well, r is is a radical. Radical three squared is just a three. All right. Radical three is about 1.7 ish. So we'll have to we'll have to ballpark it a little bit, but that's okay. So I'd plot two five, that's my center. And then go out a little bit less than two units in every direction. And then draw a circle. Now, the last one is kind of worded funny. You know, it says center at negative three, two, tangent to the x axis. So the left side is going to be the same or similar anyway than number one, except x minus negative three, so x plus three, y minus two instead of y plus two. The radius, well, if you know what tangent means, then this is easy. If not, then this is going to be important. Tangent just means that it touches the x-axis, in this case, it's tangent to the x-axis, touches the x-axis only once. So the only way that that would play out is if a point on the circumference only touched but didn't intersect the x-axis. So it would have to look something like this, right? except that's not a circle, so let me fix that. We'll get to that topic in a little bit. But ultimately, it's implying that the radius has to be equal to, to a two, right? In order for that to be the case. Because if it were anything bigger than a two, let's say were, the radius was three, for example, or at really anything bigger than two, you'll see it's not tangent to the x-axis, it's touching it in multiple locations. If it were less than two, it wouldn't touch the x-axis at all. It has to touch the x-axis in exactly one location. The only way to do that is if the radius is equal to two, which makes r squared equal to four. Right. So sometimes you have to reason it out, but it's really, that, that's the extent of the difficulty when it comes to circles and, and their graphs. But you notice on the next page, the equations are not quite as neighborly. Right. So what we have to do is get these equations into standard form and then use that information to write the equation. Uh, I'm sorry, to determine the important piece. All right. Now, that's assuming you're doing it algebraic. I'll show you how you can do it non-algebraically in a little bit. All right. So that's in graphic. So the process is going to be complete the square. for both X and Y. This is uh, probably the, the least useful set of steps ever because there's a lot of Im implication behind the scenes. Complete the square for both X and Y. You need to know how to complete the square in order to do that, All right? But then once you do that, you get it into the form x minus h squared plus y minus k squared is equal to r squared. All right, but really the key to everything is, is the completing the square process. 
It's actually not too crazy. It's just, you know, when I say you're completing the square for both X and Y, it makes it seem like it's going to be pretty funky, but it's really not that bad, right? It, there's a lot of behind the scenes knowledge that needs to be in place and, and that has to do with completing the square. But if you're, if you're pretty solid on the completing the square technique, then this, this will be fine, right? But even if you're not, you, you follow along and you'll see that it's pretty consistent with the example I started the class off with, right? So first thing we're gonna do in order to complete the square for X and Y is we're gonna group the X terms together group the Y terms together, and then get rid of any constant. So really the very first step would be to get rid of that 23, that negative 23. So I'd have X squared. I wanna group the X terms together. So X squared plus six X, I'm gonna leave a little space to complete the square for the X terms. Plus Y squared, minus four Y. I'm gonna leave a little space to complete the square for the Y's. And the whole thing's gonna be equal to 23, right? So each one of these components, the X component and the Y component is quadratic in nature, right? So each one is in the form of A, well, this one is AX squared plus BX plus, you know, some C value that we don't know. And this one would be in the form, well, the same expression just with Y's instead of X's, right? So this one we could think of as a Y squared minus BY plus C, all right? With its own set of A's and B's. Uh, that's my plus sign didn't show up. So what we're gonna do is compute B squared over 4A for this part. And then we'll compute a B squared over 4A for this part. And whatever answer we get is gonna go in the blank and then also get added to the right-hand side. All right, so my B squared is gonna be six squared. My A value is a one. So six squared over four times one, 36 over four is nine. So that's gonna get added here and also here. Can't add something to one side of an equation without adding it to the other, all right. For the second part, the Y component, again, a B squared over 4A. So my B value is negative four. I'm gonna square that and divide it by four times the A value for this piece, which happens to also be a one, right? So 16 over four, 16 divided by four is four. So I'm adding four into this piece, but can't just add it to one side of an equation without adding it to the other. So I'm going to add a four over here also. So then we're going to factor because each one of these, the whole point behind completing the square is to complete the perfect square trinomial. Um, debating color scheme here. I'm going to go purple. This is a perfect square trinomial. And so is this. And they're both separated by a plus sign. So this factors, remember it's square root of the first term, square root of the last term, carry down the middle sign, x plus three squared. The second one factors square root of the first term, square root of the last term, carry down the middle sign, so y minus two squared. Bring on down the plus sign here, Combine the terms on the other side, these all equal 36. And you put it together anyway. Professor, can you scroll down a little bit? Mm 
So now we have our equation. And I just want to see what the center and the radius would be here. The center, h and k value, negative three, positive two. And that's what we learned on the previous page that all we're really doing is taking whatever sign is contained within the binomial and just flipping it. It was positive, make it negative. It was negative, make it positive. And whatever the square root of this number is, that's going to be my radius. Right. So that's the algebraic approach for finding the equation of a circle in standard form. Right. So x plus 3, close it up, square it, plus y minus 2, close it up, square it, equals 36. All right. You can eyeball the center, or you could just plot it. That looks like it's the center. And if you count boxes, you'll see that it's six points, six units from the center to any point on the circumference. All right. Now, if we had taken the original equation, x squared plus y squared plus 6x minus 4y, minus 23 equals zero and popped it into Desmos, it would, it would actually graph it for us, All right? So if it's convenient enough of, you know, the coordinates are not, you know, weird decimals or anything like that, then you could most likely pull out the center and the radius just by typing in your general equation. And then it just becomes a matter of putting that into the a, you know, the x minus h squared plus y minus k squared is equal to r squared for me, right? So you could actually get the answer without doing any of this completing the square stuff. However, if a question asks you to determine the standard form equation using the completing the square technique, you don't have a choice. In which case, the ant just knowing the answer doesn't get you any credit, right? But if it's a multiple choice question, which of the following is the equation of the circle who's in standard form, whose general form is x squared plus y squared, blah, 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 then you're in good shape, right? Also, you know, recurring theme in this course, never a bad idea to have, an, have a sense of what the answer is going into the question, right? So if we go to number two, Type it in, x squared plus y squared plus y squared minus 8x plus 10y plus 25 equals zero. You know, you just start counting boxes. It looks like 4, negative 5 is going to be the center. So four negative five is a center with a radius of one, two, three, four units, All right? So I have this idea that going into the problem, the center, four negative five, the radius is equal to four. So my equation would be X minus four squared plus Y plus five squared is equal to 16. That being said, if I got to do it with completing the square, that's good to know. That's good information. I still got to show the work, right? So that would play out. Again, we want to get rid of this value here. I want to reorganize, right? So it's going to be x squared. The x's go together, x squared minus 8x. Leave a space to complete the square, plus y squared plus 10y. Leave a space to complete the square is equal to negative 25. All right. Each one of these gets a b squared over 4a. So this one would be negative 8 squared over 4 times 1. So 64 over 4 is 16. And then for this one, 10 squared over 4 times 1 
is going to be 25. So I would add a 16 to both sides. I would add a 25 to both sides. All right. But then this is where you could kind of get a little cute with everything. Because you know the answer going into the problem because you use Desmos, uh, Desmos efficiently. Really, the next step would be to factor and simplify. So really, the next step from my perspective, if I'm grading your work, should be for you to come up with the final answer. If you already know what the final answer is, you can just go right to it. Right? It was this work that I would need to see. Right? I'll leave a little star on number three. Because now we want to move on to ellipses. Ellipses are interesting. They're, they're circular, but in the sense that, you know, like a circle, you're going the same distance in every direction. For an ellipse, you're going the same distance in certain directions. Right? So there is symmetry, but not not the same kind of symmetry as it would be for, an, for a circle, right? The way that you would recognize the difference between an ellipse and a circle would be based off of the coefficients of the x squared and y squared values. Like for example, in this case, if I just pop a two as a coefficient for the y, you notice how it's no longer completely circular, it's oval now, right? If the, if the coefficients are the same sign, both positive or both negative for the x squared and y squared terms, but they're different numbers, let's say that this is like, like if this is a two, then it, it's back to be in a circle, except it just disappeared on me. So it, may not, it actually might not exist, but let's say it's a 12, no, 12 is not a good example. That looks fine. Let's see, let's make this a four. Would that work? Oh, it's not big enough. All right, so I'd make this like 225, but negative. There we go. So, you know, you have some values that, you know, like it really doesn't matter too, too much what's happening after the X squared and Y squared. But if the coefficients are the same, it's a circle. If they're different, it's an ellipse. If they're both negative, it, it, it sometimes doesn't work, but most of the time it does. But if you see if the signs are opposite to one another, even if the absolute values are the same, it creates this other figure, which is known as a hyperbola. So that's an interesting one. But for now, we're just going to focus on the case of the ellipse. All right. So. A set of all points in a plane such that the sum of the distances from two fixed points, also known as foci, is constant. All right. And so what that's telling us, and it's it's really kind of weird to visualize without a, a manipulative, but let's say I just draw an arbitrary ellipse. You'd have two points that define your ellipse. These are known as foci. All right. They take on really the same role as the center would in a circle, except it's not really the center of the ellipse. There is a true center to the ellipse. That would be right smack dab in the middle, right? But what this is saying, this whole explanation here, it's saying that if I have any point on the circumference of this ellipse, its distance from each focus Add it together, so I'll call this F1 and F2, focus one, focus two. That distance here, so this distance is gonna be the same no matter where this point is, right? So if I put that point over here, for example, I'll do it in red. If I put that point over here, this distance added to this distance, if I can get it to line. Well, that's, that's fun. It thinks I want to make a polygon and that's not good. 
We just kind of make it miss a little bit. And then going off the rails. Okay, now I got to resize, change it. Change the angle a little bit. Yeah, I don't know why that was playing out the way it was, but this distance here added to this distance here would be the same as the sum of those two purple line segments if I were to add those together. All right. It's kind of a strange thing to think about, but um, if you've ever actually created an ellipse by hand, or any kind of oval, whether it's for like an arts and crafts activity or or like engineering activity or you know, I mean anything in a science class or you know if you did it in a math class that would be something. Um, then you probably have already experienced this. But basically, what what you would be doing is taking a couple of thumbtacks. You know, stabbing it into a piece of cardboard, for example, you tie a piece of string onto each one and then put your pencil in between in that string until the, the string becomes taut and then you run it around the circumference and it becomes an ellipse, right? The length of that string never changes. And so that's the physical manifestation of what's happening here, right? So it's, it's strange, but it, it, there is a, a physical manifestation of the, of the concept of an ellipse, right? Um, so I have, I have formulas here and everything like that, but it's very easy to visualize these things in Desmos. So I have the uh, that huge gap there for some reason. I, don't, I definitely don't need that much space, but maybe I'll just write big. So an ellipse, again, set of all points, such that the distance from the two foci is constant, but we don't actually need that in order to write the equation of, ellipse, of an ellipse. So if you look up the definition of, a, of an ellipse, the standard form, you see something that's a little bit different from what I use here. I just like this variation better, okay? So x squared over delta x squared plus y squared over delta y squared, all right? The delta x squared is a horizontal change from center and delta y squared is the vertical change from center, right? So what happens is if I draw an ellipse, I would have some natural center, a distance from the center to the extreme points horizontally, we would call that delta x, some horizontal change delta x. I don't do things like answering phones. The vertical change from center would be delta y. One second. Just had to mute that. All right, so the delta x delta y gives us the change from center. That change is symmetric. So we would go to the right delta x units, but we would also go to the left delta x units. So this is also delta x. We would go up delta y units. We would also go down delta y units. And it doesn't really look very vertical. Close enough. My horizontals don't look horizontal. So it's kind of bugging me out a little bit. So let me just do that real quick. Let's do it in one stretch, one shot here. Because I don't think my ellipse was perfectly um, level to begin with. Take this one from scratch here. 
horizontal, want to lock in nicely, vertical, and then I'll do my ellipse. About to give this up and do it on Desmos. Come on, just lock in. Okay. I'm going to get rid of all the schmutz. A little bit better. So my delta X, my delta Y. That long lens. All right. So if I know what the center is, which is defined as HK. I can figure out the extreme points on the graph and that would give me what are called vertices, All right? So each one of these points here is a vertex. All right, each one of them is a vertex. Together, they're, they're called vertices. All right, vertices, vertices is the plural for vertex. Right. So we would have four of them. And right? just like if we were to draw a circle, we would probably plot four points and then do the best we could to, to create a circular path through those four points. It's the same thing with an ellipse. We plot four points and do the best we can to plot an ellipse through those four points. Right. But we also have names for these line segments. One is called the major axis. And the other is called the minor axis. All right. The major axis is the longer of the two axes. It's the line segment passing through the foci and intersecting the vertices. And the minor is just simply perpendicular to that. But the major, the length of the major, axis is greater than the length of the minor axis. which makes sense. One's called major, the other's called minor. They would never be equal because if they were equal, if you went out the same distance in each direction, it wouldn't be an ellipse, it would be a circle, right? So the blue line segment here would be the major axis and the red one, yeah, it is red, it would be the, horizontal, uh, would be the, uh, the minor axis. Now, we also have to account for what are known as foci. So let me get that on here, All right? Now, foci are kind of weird in the sense that, you know, there are two points that define the ellipse, but how they're defined is a little bit different, right? The distance from the end point of the, or the minor axis to one of the foci is equal to half the distance of the major axis, right? Which is just, just really very strange. But what that's saying is that the major, in this particular case, for example, the blue axis here, it's got some length. We don't know what it is, but half of it, half of that length, we know is equivalent to delta x. All right, so delta x. Now, and, and that would be true on both sides. Actually, let me do the... squiggly bracket thingy on both sides here, all right? So the end point on the minor axis, so let me do that in green, to one, of, one or both of the foci is gonna be equal to half the length of the major axis. So there's gonna be some point here along this line that's gonna be equal to in terms of the distance, delta x units away from that vertex. All right, so this distance here, whatever it is, that's gonna be equivalent to delta x, All right? So we know that this one is delta y, this is gonna create a perpendicular intersection. And so what we do is we call this, you know, some, some value 
doesn't matter what we call it. I have a particular name for it in a second, but let's say we call it F, capital F for focus, right? It's really the distance from the center to the focus, but just for simplicity, I'm just gonna call it F. What I would have here is a Pythagorean relationship, right? And that would be that F squared plus delta Y squared is equal to delta X squared. If I wanna solve for F, I would subtract delta y squared from both sides. And we would come up with f squared is equal to delta x squared minus delta y squared. All right. And when I take the square root, I would get f is equal to the square root of delta x squared minus delta y squared. Right. So what that would give us is the distance that the focus would be away from the center, right, along the major axis. All right. Now I have shortcuts for this because that that's a lot. Right? You wouldn't want to have to do this every time. And I can tell you that everything gets kind of flipped on its head if the major axis is vertical. But let me show you that real quick. Not too quick. quick. So I'm gonna do a little grab of this again. I'm gonna rotate. make it a little bit bigger. So this is a case where the major axis is vertical, but the relationship is still true. The length along the minor axis leads us to endpoints. Those endpoints are known as vertices, right? If I just focus on one of them, let's say for example, this one, I would have some distance delta x that gets me from the center to that vertex, but from that vertex to the major axis in a straight line relationship, we would have the location of the focus somewhere along this line in the instance where this line segment going from green point to green point is half the length of the major axis. Right, so in this instance, the major axis, the major axis is delta y. Right, so this line segment here would be delta y. Now f would be a vertical change. It's still Pythagorean in the sense that you have a right angle, but now it would be f squared plus x squared. No, I'm sorry, delta x squared is equal to delta y squared, which actually reverses everything, right? So we, have, we would have the same type of relationship in that the structure would be the same, except the two pieces would be reversed. Right? So what I say is that, well, if delta x corresponds with the major axis, then that has to be the bigger of the two between delta x and delta y. If our standard form has denominator values of delta x squared, delta y squared, then these two items here, delta x squared, delta y squared, constitute denominators of the original standard form, right? So if it's a horizontal major axis, then what I'm looking at here is the bigger of the two denominators minus the smaller of the two denominators. Need more room to run. So, 
So if I take the two denominators, subtract from the big one, the little one, and then take the square root without doing any of this work, I can get the, the distance from the center to each one of the two foci, all right? And that, that would be the same relationship no matter what the orientation is. Whatever the bigger denominator is minus the little denominator, that's going to dictate the distance from center to focus. All right, so I put that all in here. But I don't like to just give that rule without some sort of context behind it, because there's a lot going on here. So for example, I think I have one right up right off the bat here. X squared plus uh, X squared over nine plus Y squared over four is equal to one. That's easy enough to graph. All right, we have our ellipse. It looks like it's wider than it is tall. So my major axis is along the horizontal axis. All right, so I would plot my vertices, negative three, zero, positive three, zero, negative two, a uh, zero, negative two, and zero, positive two. All right, if you turn on the labels, it actually puts the numbers there for you, all right? Because it, it's saying here, if you look at the instructions, and I'll, I'll scroll up in a minute, but I wanted to keep these notes on the screen. Find the coordinates of the center, foci, and vertices and graph the ellipse. Well, I've already graphed the ellipse on Desmos. That's fine. We, we know that that's a, that's a rule. You're allowed to do that. Right? But now I have the, the vertices plotted also. Right? The center is at 0, 0. I'll plot that too. I think it's obvious, but I'll plot it anyway. So now I have that accounted for. So the only thing I would need would be the foci. All right. So that's why these rules are so important because that's the only thing that Desmos isn't going to give you. All right. So if I want to create the sketch of the graph, if I, if I want to do it on paper, it's easy enough too. Because like if you do a ballpark sketch of it, it's fine also. All right. But, you know, I could plot. Easy enough. I'm going to the left three. I'm going to the right three. I'm going up two. I'm going down two. And I draw a smooth ellipse or as smooth as I can. It looks wonderful, but I still need the foci. All right. So I have a horizontal major axis. And that's because delta x is greater than delta y, all right? Because remember, the standard form is x squared over delta x squared, y squared over delta y squared. So if you're not counting boxes on Desmos, you're looking at that form and saying, this is equal to delta x squared, and this one is equal to delta y squared, all right? So, Therefore, delta x has to be three, delta y has to be equal to two. All right, that's how you know left without using the calculator if you needed to do that. That's how you know you're going left three, right three, up three, down, uh, up two, down two. All right, so again, still need the foci because I got everything else. All right, and if I'm doing it on paper, yeah, it's it's tedious, but I can get that information in there. Plot the center. Zero, zero, three, zero, negative three, zero, zero, two, zero, negative two. All right. So that's where my big D, little d rule comes into play, where I say the big denominator minus the little denominator under the radical. That's the distance from the center to focus. So I'll say distance from center to focus
So the square root of the bigger denominator minus the little denominator. So nine minus four is gonna be the square root of five, all right? So that focus value, radical five, that's the distance from the center to the focus along the major axis, all right? That means, because that's approximately two and change. You know, if I pop in the square root of five, that's about 2.24. That's telling me to the, go to the right 2.24 units, the so ballpark right, roughly here, but also to go to the left because there's two foci. And then we could just label that, well, you're taking zero and adding to it radical five and subtracting from it radical five. So this would be negative radical five comma zero, and this would be uh, positive radical five comma zero. All right. So manageable, but tedious, all right? Now, I did create a Desmos for you to use on Blackboard. Right? If you go under calculators, unit three, unit three calculators, you'll see the one that says ellipses. And it does, it really does a lot of this stuff for you. It's just, you gotta kind of know what you're looking for or looking at, all right? So let me pull that one up. It, it's, it's really a simple program, it's called ellipses. So I'll just pull it up on my end here. So given an ellipse, now I have it with A's and B's because putting a Delta X in there is kind of a pain, but you'd have to, and, and you'll see everything's plotted for you, it's just kind of, Kind of weird to look at. Um, H and K would be zero and zero because it's centered at zero, zero. Horizontal displacement from center, uh, I slid on the wrong thing. Uh, horizontal displacement from center, again, it's a pain to try to put in a delta X. That's saying delta X, All right? So I, I still need my delta X. I still need to be able to pull that from the function. But once I do, I could put that into Desmos. My delta X was three, happens to be what was stored in there. My delta Y is two, we're good to go there. Coordinates of the center, coordinates of the vertices. Oops, I hate when that happens. I don't know why that happens. All right, so I have coding for that. And then distance from center to focus, but it's in, um, in decimal form. And then coordinates of the focus, or the foci, if there's a vertical major axis, you click on one folder. If it's a horizontal major axis, you click on the other. So you still need to know, but it'll do all, you know, most of the work for you, all right? So this one is a horizontal major axis. It'll plot those points. They're a little on the messier side, but, it'll give you the values that you need, all right? So going to the next one, I pull out all the information that I need because the, the standard form X minus H squared over Delta X squared plus Y minus K squared over Delta Y squared is equal to one. So if you're using the Desmos, then you want to pull all this information out. You need H, K, you need Delta X, Delta Y. The H value is negative four. The K value is negative two. Delta X is the square root of this number, right? It's whatever the, the value is that's associated with the X term, right? So it's in the X fraction. So that number is the square root of which would be the Delta X, all right? This one's in the Y fraction. So this number would give us my Delta Y. So we're looking at three, we're looking at five, all right? So if you're using this Desmos, pop in your negative four, your negative two, 
three for your horizontal displacement from center, which is delta x, vertical displacement from center, which is delta y. Coordinates for center will get labeled, vertices will all get labeled. All right, so that's good stuff. But I'm looking at an ellipse that's taller than it is y. All right, so this is a vertical major axis. And that's because delta x is smaller than delta y. All right, so that tells me if I'm using this Desmos or a vertical major axis, turn off the horizontal major axis folder turn on the vertical major axis folder. And then you could pull out all this information and get it onto your graph if you need to, or you could just submit the Desmos depending on uh, what you're working on. And so I got some points here, negative one, negative two. My center, I turned off the label for some reason, negative four, negative two. But in reality, sometimes it's easier to plot the points just based off of your knowledge of center and displacement. Like I can plot negative four, negative two. That's right here. That's my center. My delta X is telling me to go three to the left, three to the right. My delta Y is telling me to go five up, five down. So I think it's easier to just count boxes, two, three, four, five, and then worry about labeling after the fact. The labeling you could pull off of Desmos if you want, but I find that it's probably a little easier to at least plot the points just by counting boxes. But, but when there's des decimals involved, yeah, Desmos is definitely the way to go, All right? So we have this nice looking ellipse here. Oh boy, yeah, that's nice looking. Well, that's as good as it's gonna get for me. Let me just move this first, whoa. Okay, well, this is getting interesting. Now, can't catch a break here. Okay, and then I'll just kind of put this back in there. All right, so then I would plot my horizontal and vertical major axis, my horizontal axis and my vertical major axis. But then I need to get my foci on there, negative four, positive two. negative four, negative six. And that's my ellipse with all the necessary points and lines, segments, and all that jazz, right? So yeah, find the coordinates of center of foci and vertices, graph the ellipse, all right? Um, let's see, time-wise, all right, probably. Yeah, all right. So that's where we're gonna leave it for tonight. Let me stop the recording. I forgot to do um, 